In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you. Brothers and sisters, today we celebrate the great solemnity of Christ the King. We acknowledge the times where we haven't allowed him to reign in our own lives, in our own hearts, uh, particularly through our sin. And so we offer ourselves up to him and ask for a change of heart so that he can truly reign in our lives. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to call all sinners. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Only Begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, whose will is to restore all things in your beloved Son, the King of the universe, grant, we pray, that the whole creation set free from slavery may render your majesty service and ceaselessly proclaim your praise. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out as a shepherd seeks out his flock. When he is among his scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered. On a day of clouds and thick darkness, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed my sheep with justice. As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, I shall judge between one sheep and another, between rams and goats. The word of the Lord. Drooping spirit, he 
Surely goodness and kindness shall follow me all the days of my life. In the Lord's own house I shall dwell forever and ever. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a man. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ, but each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be, to be destroyed is death. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who put all things in subjection under him, so that God may be all in all. The word of the Lord. Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his apostles, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels are with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another. As a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers or ancestors of mine, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, 
and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Today we celebrate the solemnity of Christ the King. And it's interesting to note when this feast actually began within the church's life, the dawn of the 20th century, when all sorts of totalitarian regimes throughout the world had fallen or risen, the church decided to remind everyone that at the end of the day, there is one being in charge, and it's God, namely the second person of the Trinity, Christ the King. It's a very important lesson that we learn from sacred scripture, and it eloquently highlights that our hope for good leadership ultimately rests in God alone. Many of us may know of the trappings of placing our hope in some sort of political leader or a new boss or a person with a new promotion, even if it's ourself. We think that if a person takes a position of power and authority, finally, everything will be perfect in the way it's meant to be. The Jewish people were very similar with that idea. Before they ever had a king, They prayed and prayed to God to give them a king so that they could become like other nations. And it was in wanting to become like other nations that they lost a sense of their identity, where God was always meant to be their king. God, of course, answered their prayer and gave them kings, but one after the other, they all fell into frailty. The first into madness, the second into adultery and murder. And it got even worse as time went on. God sought to try to communicate that through these human leaders, they could not save the human race. They could point us towards a savior as they were called to do, but they were not themselves our savior. God alone is. God is the leader. Well, this applies just as it did to the Jewish people, also to the leadership within the church and the leadership in the family and the leadership in the political world. At the end of the day, God is in charge and establishing who's in charge is very important in our life. It's not a power trip to do this. It's a manner in which we entrust ourselves to the leadership of one we trust. And when leadership has failed us, which it always will for every generation, from one generation to the next, because we're human, God wants us to entrust ourselves in the midst of that dysfunction, always and ultimately to him as Christ the King. He chastens leadership to remind them that their choices and their will is always meant to be docile to his law and his plans. Why? Because he is definitively and perfectly good. Unlike us, God will never ask us to do something that's contrary to love, truth, and justice. I think of the ordination of a bishop as an example of where this is illustrated. If you've ever been to the ordination of a bishop, one of the rituals is that they pick up the book of the Gospels and they hold it over top of the bishop's head, reminding the bishop that he is called not to be superior to the word of God and to his will and revelation, but rather that he stands at the service of it underneath it, 
that he subjects himself to God's kingship and only seeks to imitate that authority from God himself. This is the very spirit with which the church is called to run itself. But we know that it fails, and if you study church history, it fails quite often. My father has always said something he, about the church and its failures. He said that the fact that the Catholic Church remains still in existence to this day is a sign that it has God's hand in it because human beings have been trying to destroy it from within for centuries. This is the reality that we face, but as a church, we recognize that God is still in control and that our obedience is ultimately towards him. Our obedience is definitely communicated through the bishops. I've taken a promise of obedience. And as St. Thomas Aquinas would say, we're obedient in all things but sin, and therefore we're called to be faithful. But when trust is broken between us and the leadership, whether that be within the church, within our family, or within the political sphere, it's very difficult to listen to the leaders tell us what to do. Jesus gives us advice about this. He says, do as the Pharisees tell you, for they sit on the throne of Moses, but do not do as they do. Again, understanding this statement to be do what's true, do what God is asking us to do, but don't sin. The difficulty is that we confront the injustices that are not dealt with. There are some who have gone through their whole life bringing to the light evils and injustices, only to be found to be treated like a whistleblower in a negative and pejorative way, silenced or criticized or mocked or humiliated. Again, this is nothing new. But they die, perhaps, never seeing justice. And what God wants us to know is that injustice, just like death, will not have the last word. In the end, the good king will come to judge. And so we hear that people will be held accountable, even if it seems in our life we have to strain through dysfunction, disorder, and sin, even from leadership who protects itself from criticism, a form of clericalism, if you will. But God will not allow any sin to be left unturned. And what a great consolation that must have been to the early Christians who were being gathered together in Colosseums to be eaten by lions, to be hated and burnt as lamps in the streets of Rome. And for those who have been hurt, not only by secular powers who have endured and caused, rather, persecution, but also persecution which we know biblically and historically occurs even within the church. God has the last word. Our job in this life is ultimately to acknowledge our own sins, to ask for his mercy, and to be willing to change our hearts. If we can do this, then we'll be the sheep on his right hand. But if we seek to justify ourselves, and even with the little power that we might have, abuse it, and we find ourselves being dishonest, not even honest with ourselves, not open to criticism, not open to allowing God to be the king that reigns in our heart and his law and his call on the church to guide us, then we will find ourselves in rebellion and will be the goats excluded from the kingdom of God. Not because of what we are, but because of what we've chosen. And what we've chosen is not the kingdom of God because we haven't chosen the king. So God places before us a decisive decision that we have to make in our life. Will we place our trust in worldly leaders, in worldly hopes, at the end of the day, that was even a temptation Jesus faced in the desert. To bow down to Satan, to become a political leader, to politically coerce his subjects into obedience to him. Christ doesn't want to do that with us. He wants to offer us freely and propose to us our faithfulness to him. 
to willingly and freely follow him out of a relationship of trust, to allow him to be the king of our lives, of our church, and of our world, and finally, of our universe. Today, may the church rededicate itself to Christ the King, who is truly the leader and will hold us all accountable in the end days. We now call to mind our King and our leader, and we profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. With faith and hope, we now turn to our loving God with our prayers and petitions. We pray for church leadership that it may always imitate its policies and laws and its pastoral service under the guidance of Christ the King. We pray to the Lord. We pray for all the baptized who are called to be Christ the King in their own vocation. We pray to the Lord. We pray that the church may always listen to the wisdom that comes from God and through the prophets. We pray to the Lord. We pray for all of us gathered today, both in the church and at our homes, that we may be consoled by the leadership God shows us as a shepherd who loves his flock. We pray to the Lord. We pray for all of those who have been wounded or hurt by authority figures, that they may find healing in the authority of Christ, who is always loving and always truthful. We pray to the Lord. We pray for an end to all injustices that happen as a result of political policies. We particularly pray for the vulnerable, for those who are ignored or marginalized, and for the rights of the unborn, as well as those who are mentally ill. We pray to the Lord. We pray for an end to all injustices, including euthanasia, especially in our country of Canada. We pray to the Lord. And finally, we pray for all the dead, especially those names written in the book of life. We also pray for the holy souls in purgatory who benefit from our prayers each day. We pray to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son to be a true leader and guide for your church. Help us to imitate his leadership, but always to point in his direction, to always seek to be docile to his will above our own. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now we gather as children of God, beloved by him, and we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Having received your word, which gives us immortality, we ask, O Lord, that glorying in obedience to the commands of Christ, the King of the universe, we may live with him eternally in his heavenly kingdom, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. <clears throat>